Father, we thank you. And as Jody said, this thing of prayer is just constant, so we just want to say, man, we're in communication with you. Each and every one of us in this room has a direct line to you, and we have it right now. And right now we set some time aside to, to be holy, to be separated from all the cares of life right now. We came into this room together just to, to dr- encourage each other. But also we came here just to be in the atmosphere where, where we're setting this time aside to, to hear you more clearly. And uh, so I just thank you that you're going to communicate to everybody. It may come through my voice, but most likely uh, most of it that's really going to be powerful will just be from your heart to their heart. But in this atmosphere, we're all going to hear you and we're all going to be changed and we're all going to be uh, encouraged and we're all going to uh, uh, have light shown on our, to our path that we need to walk in, each and every one of us individually. So I thank you for that. We agree for that. We pray one for another right now. Father, we pray for the person on our right, on our left, and behind us, in front of us, because we don't all know what's going on, but we know this, that you are never, ever ceasing to work in their life, and you have wonderful plans for them. And so we want to get in on that and pray for each other right now that uh, uh, each one of us will, will just step up in a little stronger way in our walk with you today and hear your voice and hear and feel your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, that's a powerful thought right there, isn't it? I want to talk about the art of discovering or the joy of discovering. You know, I, 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 not too many people I, I would think would not want to, um, well, go look for hidden treasure. I was going to say, but not all of us probably want to be out in the ocean doing it. But uh, what a fun thing to look for a hidden sunken ship or hidden treasures and et cetera. And you and I get to, uh, we've, we, I sometimes think about, the, we're singing about that new generation coming up. And I'm thinking, man, I, I had a, you know, there's a privilege of people that uh, 200 years ago were missionaries that rode ships for three months to get to their land. And then they stayed there their whole lifetime. And some of them went to the Amazon and to minister to tribes. I mean, how, what challenging and what excitement if you would love that stuff. You know, and then I feel like, man, God picked the right time for me to go overseas because I, I like flying uh, rather than boats. Uh, and, uh, you know, coming and going and, and then get to see Burma before it was uh, modernized. You know, I got to see uh, it with nothing but ox carts. I've, had, I've got so many fond memories of landing in a little airport and it's just a chicken coop and, and uh, all those things. But, uh, and now it's getting modernized real fast. And I think there's not too many places that aren't. Albania is modernizing so fast. And I think, what are the younger generation going to get to do for excitement? And I go, man, uh, you know, in the natural, uh, they're going to get to go down deep in the ocean like we've never been before. There's people I've been listening to the other day, and they just said, man, I, I envy this new generation. They're going to get to go in space. They're going to get to go deep in the sea, things that we couldn't even see or advance, phantom, and they're going to get to do that. And our grandsons are, you know, they're kind of excited about going into outer space. That's not really, uh, that's not really exciting me. I'm not, I guess I'm a chicken there, man. I don't mind flying, but I'm not, I don't think I want to go to outer space. Uh, but in the area of walking with God, the, the adventure it never ends. And part of it is the greatest adventure and journey and discovery you're ever going to find is inside you. Not deep in the sea or in the sky, it's inside you. It, God is, if we could understand just how, what he's done inside of us and wants to do inside of us and know that that was the most adventurous, uh, incredible discovery that anybody could ever find is what Christ in us, the hope of glory. Uh, <clears throat> my goodness, can you imagine just young people who grow in this area, and we are growing. The body of Christ is stronger now than it's ever been in, in the history, both in numbers but, and also in quality. And Because his kingdom, he said, would never cease increasing. So actually, this generation coming up is going to know more about how to walk in the kingdom of God than any generation that's ever lived. Because that's, and it's going to continue on. But the idea of people who absolutely, as we sing these songs, I'm no longer a slave to, to, uh, to fear. Do you know what it would, have you ever thought really what it would be like to absolutely never be a slave to your fear again? You know, I mean, we have moments of it, amen? And then we have moments when it just grips us and it can be 
the strange times where all of a sudden you're just, you're, you know, somebody said to me this morning, I woke up this morning and I just had a dread of my future. And I can't figure out why. And, and uh, so what to be free from that. Uh, so I? so I want to talk about that. So I, I, I'm going to go through some verses here that um, in Proverbs. I was just going to mention them, but I think I'm going to read them because it's a little more powerful. Proverbs 26. By the way, one of the greatest, one thing that you can do is just uh, get your phone, download a Bible app, and get the where it uh, will read it to you, and just listen to one proverb uh, every morning. It doesn't take much. I missed several this month, but for the most part, it's really kind of good just to to read a proverb every morning, every month. And so I was doing that the other day up for on the 26th because it's the 26th. Proverb. It says, like snow in the summer and like rain in harvest, so is honor, so honor is not fitting for a fool. Like a sparrow in its flitting and like a swallow in its flying, so a curse without cause does not a flight, uh, a light. A whip is for a horse and a bridle for a donkey and a rod for the back of fools. Now you gotta, gotta start feeling sorry for the fools here, okay? Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like him. Answer a fool and his folly deserves. Uh, answer a fool as his folly deserves, lest he be wise in his own eyes. He cuts off his own feet and drinks violence. Who sends a message by the hand of a fool? <laughs> wow, is that powerful? You ever send a message through a fool? Man, you'd be better off to cut off your feet. <laughs> That's pretty gross. Verse seven, like the legs which hang down from. Uh, from the lame, so a proverb in the mouth, so is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. Like one who binds a stone in a sling, so it, it so is he who gives honor to a fool. Like a thorn which falls from the hand of a drunkard, so the proverb in the mouth of a fool. Like an archer who wounds everyone, so is he who hires a fool. <laughs> Isn't that the scariest thing? All oh, you have had to hire people. You know that sometimes there's just nobody else coming to hot work except fools. So I don't know what you do there. Like the archer with, who wounds everyone, so is, uh, so is he who hires a fool and, uh, and hires those who pass by. Like a dog that returns to his vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. Man, I'm telling you, he's just beating the daylights out of a fool. Listen to this, though. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than him. Man, isn't that a kicker? 11 verses just pounding on a fool, getting you all caught up, and how, well, what an idiot, what a fool. And then it says, He who is wise in his own eyes, there's more hope for the fool than him. Mercy. And so, in one way, we get this paradox. We don't need to think that we're wise. We don't need to, th we, we're all trying to prove to everybody that we got something. We're trying to, you know, oh, did I do good? You know, we look for the accolades. We look for the pat on the back. And we look for, you know, and we tell our stories to say, man, I did pretty good at this job. I got an A on this test or whatever else. But, you know, here we are all struggling to think that we're wise. And that the Bible says, he who thinks he's wise in his own eyes, there's more hope for a fool. And that's why sometimes I think, man, we're sometimes some of the things we're doing that look so good are so wrong. In fact, we've had a culture right now in the last 20 years of trying to raise the self-esteem of our students. And the statistics now are showing that we're in big trouble because we did that. They're, they're in big trouble because we did that. We got them so self-conscious of themselves that their self-esteem has risen and their production and everything else has fallen. There's more hope for a fool than that. We did the wrong thing there. And, <clears throat> and that's, that's coming from psychiatrists and psychologists that are saying, man, we made a big boo-boo when we started try doing this in our education system and in our families. But here's the paradox, you know. You do not think that you're wise in your own eyes. You know, and part of it, I want to just encourage one more time here. That means stop worrying about what everybody thinks of you and trying to prove that you got something. Boy, it's such a pressure. I thought about it. My, I got all these grandkids, and they're all playing sports, and, 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 and I hope not, but I wonder, man, if they're going to start comparing with each other. 
Marty and I, we didn't have that pressure on us because we had no cousins playing sports with it. We knew, you know, so we had no, you know, we didn't get to play that much. So we didn't have that pressure. But that's a, there's so much pressure in comparisons and all that. And so often by doing that, we actually miss what we're really called to do. But for all of us, don't think too wisely of yourself. But here's the balance to it. But we get to believe that Christ has been made unto us righteousness. In 1 Corinthians 1.30, it says, By his doing, I love this verse, you know that. By his doing, not ours, by his doing, you are in Christ. By his own choice, you're in Christ, and Christ is in you by his doing. Hallelujah, he picked you. And by his doing, you are in Christ, who became unto us the wisdom of God. So we can boldly stand up and say, listen, I don't think I'm wise in myself, but I can tell you this. There's a Christ inside of me, and he has become the wisdom of God in me. I have the wisdom of God inside of me. That's not boasting on me. It is all about him, and, it's, and it, he became my righteousness, he became my sanctification. He makes me, that sanctification means he make, sets you apart as extraordinary. But it says, just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is freedom for us. This is incredible for us. This, this allows all of our energy and everything else to be free and not be suppressed. This, to humble ourselves and say, I've got nothing on my own, but I'm telling you this. I'm in Christ, and Christ is in me, and i got everything, man. And that's, that's just the way it is. And whether anybody votes for it or not, likes it or not, gives me a award or not, really doesn't matter because that's what I believe. I believe Christ is in me, and he's become the wisdom of God inside of me, and, he's, you know, and no matter... I'm just not even looking at the circumstances. I'm not looking at my grades. I'm not looking at my checkbook to evaluate. I'm not looking about what other people say about me to find out who I am and how I'm doing. I'm looking to one person, God, and he says I'm, I'm the wisdom of God. And he says that I'm right. I'm the way I should be. And he says that I have been set apart and that he's redeemed me and that I'm on top. Hallelujah. Boy, you, if you can stay in those two extremes of not seeing yourself as wise at all, in your own efforts, but, but boast in the Lord that he came into you by his own doing, and by his, to, so he gets all the credit. Man, I'm telling you, that's a freedom that will release people into to victory in their life and so many things. And, and if uh, our children, uh, this next generation, can discover and walk in that more than we have, they're gonna, uh, you know, we're just going to see more and more phenomenal things. But we're not done yet, by the way. None of you are. We can grow in this. Amen? Every one of us in here can grow in this. So you are righteous, and you are spirit-filled, and now you get to discover how to walk in it. You know, and part of it is just, uh, <clears throat> so many people are trying to, oh, I need to do better, I need to be a better Christian, I need to go to church more, I need to read my Bible, no, no, no. Somehow you got to just quit that stuff and just say, no, 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 no. By his doing, I'm right, not by my effort. Now, I need to know that it's just done, it's finished. But now I need to grow up and learn how to walk in it. I need to find, I, I, it's mine already. Everything, everything God has is already mine. I'm a joint heir with Jesus already. It's all done. I just need to learn how to walk in it. I need to, I need to discover what it is. I, you know, I'm filthy rich. I need to know how to write checks. You know, there are people that I got a lot of money that don't know how to write a check. You know, and, and so, <clears throat> so you got to kind of, Spend your time thinking about those things and discovering those things and not just listening to everything in the house is going on the noise that's in the world. So let me just read. So, oh, by the way, did you know this? Two thousand biochemical processes. Two thousand. That's a lot, right? Two thousand. Biochemical processes are happening in one cell in your body right now. Every second, 2,000 processes are happening in every... You've got trillions of cells in your body, and every second, 2,000 chemical reactions are taking place for you to live. I don't know about you, but that's just downright scary. And they got to be perfect. 
And we're just a walking miracle. I mean, it's like, man, when you think nothing is going on, oh, Lord, nothing's happening in my life is boring. It's like, <laughs> inside this little bunny of yours, they're just, who could comprehend that much stuff going on? There's things to be discovered. Psalms 34, 19, it says, Many are the afflictions of, of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. You're righteous. What's it look like? What, how's, it, how's it going to work? We need to discover. Okay, I'm, instead of saying, oh, man, that happens to the righteous. I wish I could be righteous. No, you, everything you read now, you read that you are already there. You are the righteous. You're not trying to get there. You don't feel bad for not being there. I don't know how to relate this other than the fact that to this day, when I see uh, 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 a police car come by, I get nervous. I don't... I, I've got friends. I think they would let me off the hook. But even if they didn't, I can pay my bills now. But it's almost like I see a cop car and instantly I'm just like, ooh. Just like I felt in high school. It's like, when will I ever grow up? When will I ever be free from this? You know, like, like they're just looking for me. And it's like, uh, the only way I know how to relate this, when are we going to just say, ah, I'm righteous. I'm not trying to get there. I just am. It's who I am. So anything it says I am, oh, I'm discovering something. The afflictions of the righteous, oh, means I'm going to have some problems. Oh, that shouldn't be a shock. Oh, but the Lord will deliver me out of all. That's, that's, that's what happens in my life. That's what happens in your life. The righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. Man, what a, what a perfect thing to understand. Because so many people say, why is this happening to me? Why not? Afflictions are going to hit everybody. But the Lord will deliver you out of them all. Sing for joy, O Lord. Uh, sing for joy in the Lord, O you righteous ones. Praise is becoming to the upright. Psalms 52, 12 says, For it is you who blesses the righteous man, O Lord. You surround him with favor as with a shield. That's me. That's you. When you and I walk, we're surrounded by the Lord. He, he, he blesses us with favor. You know, it used to bother Lisa, and probably still does, but Daniel McCarty sometimes would get bumped in to up, you know, class or a better class than the plane or whatever else. And it, he would just, you know, he goes, I got bumped up. And he goes, God loves me. It's the favor of God. And so at least, you know, the team would go. So what are we, chap? I mean, you know, how can we didn't get bumped so we don't have the love of God? You know, in one way, Daniel was saying the right thing, uh, you know, because it was at the same time, uh, we, you know, a lot of times we'll, yeah, it worked for you, it don't work for me. And we got to get rid of that. We got to realize that, man, it doesn't matter. You know, you say, well, they're, they're healed, but I'm not. Yeah, but your time's coming. They weren't at one time. Well, they're, they're really blessed now. They weren't at one time. Come on, you're just taking a slice of the moment right now instead of looking at the bigger picture. Hallelujah. There's a bigger picture. So you're on your journey to find your healing or find your victory or whatever else. Enjoy the journey instead of complaining about it. Get in the boat and go find some fish. So you are the righteous. So, so man, when you read your Bible, look at it that way instead of thinking, oh, I, oh, oh that doesn't apply to me because I'm not very good. James 5.16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much or make much power to other people. That's you. You have effective prayers. When you pray, it makes power available to other people. Proverbs 28.1 says, The wicked flee when no one is pursuing, but the righteous is bold as a lion. Man, Hallelujah. That's me. So I've been thinking about my flight to Singapore, and I realized I got to get off on, uh, you know, in, in one town in Japan, and I got to go grab my suitcases, and I got to go out, and I got to find a bus, and I got to pay them 40 bucks, and they got to take me to another airport, and it's an hour and a half away, and I've only got four hours, you know, and I got to get in, check in, and, and every once I go, <gasps> what if? And I can see myself, you know. Sometimes I see myself as, Mr. Traveler, other times I see myself as a little boy. Hey, can somebody help me? <laughs> Does anybody speak English? <laughs> you know, or where's that dang bus? <laughs> or what do you mean it just left? <laughs> and there's not another one for an hour. And I go, man, but the righteous, they're bold as a lion. I'm going to be bold. And I may be late, but I'm going to be bold. And then Romans 1.17 
This is, this is the reality. Righteous people live by faith, period. We don't live, we live under a whole different set of rules than anybody else. We don't live by the sweat of our brow. We don't have, God doesn't help those that help themselves. That's not, that's not scriptural. We're not, <clears throat> we're not living by our hard effort. Man, people can brag, oh, that person self-made man, that person he's dedicated, that person this, that, yeah. And you go, go man, that's great because that's their life. Hallelujah. I'm going to honor that. But see, I'm a righteous man. I'm a righteous man. And so I, live, I don't live in the same rules. I'm in a different kingdom. There's a kingdom of this world and there's a kingdom of God. And I, I'm not in the old kingdom anymore. I've been transferred out of it. So I can't play by the rules over there anymore. And the rules are then this one, I live by faith. See, now you can have the feeling, oh, I wish I had more faith, or I wish I was better at faith, or you can ditch that and say, wait a minute. No, the package that I got that was free to me of righteousness came with everything I needed. It's all right inside here. I have the faith inside here. That's, I live by that, and that's, that's who I am. I'm not trying anymore. I'm not working hard. I'm not living by the sweat of my brow. I'm not praying hard. I'm not reading hard. I'm doing all that. I'm just living free in this brand new experience of Christ living inside of me, and I love it. And I get to live with a whole bunch of people that don't know anything about it, but I get to just be a, a light to them. I can, I can do business with them and shine with them. I don't even have to tell them a whole lot. They're going to start feeling it. They're going to start feeling the presence, but the, I live by faith. All right, let me read this to you. This is John Ruff's testimony. <clears throat> yeah. It says, the title is, Why God, or Why God, question mark, what about me? He goes, he says, depression. I'm not talking about a bad, having a bad day or two. I'm talking about major depression, a struggle that lasted over 30 years. If you never tried to, uh, to breathe under the suffocating weight of depression, you probably never read the obituaries and questioned why successful, worthwhile people, those whose lives really mattered and counted for something, got their numbers called, why you had to figure out how to make it through another day and you are still alive. That's the kind of depression I'm talking about. Decades of being too scared to end my life and too despondent to live it. My mind constantly reminded me of all I could have, would have, and should have done, but I, had I been free from depression. Those indictments kept me locked in a mental prison. And I talked to John's son, John, and he just said, my dad, it was a hard thing to live with him. He, this depression was so strong in him. I was raised to believe that I was a lesser person, not as good as the other kids. A born loser. Let me just throw this in. Man, John was a good-looking kid from the time he was little. He's well-built. He, he just had a charming thing. You know, most people thought he was a model, <laughs> but his wife dressed him. And, uh, but he was just, you know, he looked like he had a lot together. He's an, an awesome guy. But he came up with this feeling in his life that he was lesser and that he was, he, and, he, and he was a loser. And this is what his dad even said to him. He says, uh, with a don't try, you'll never make it anyway attitude. When I was 15 years old, I found that after drinking a beer or two, I was just as good as everybody else. <laughs> uh, uh, humors me because that's so true. This led to over 25 years of using alcohol to feel normal. I didn't know why I drank until I got into an alcohol treatment program. This knowledge helped me quit drinking, but sobriety unmasked the depression. Plus, when I quit drinking, I lost all my friends, and the only way I ever knew, have known for making new friends. Without the alcohol to mask the pain and no friends for a distraction, the sense of worthlessness was felt, and hurt, uh, felt head on all day, nearly every day. The pain was unimaginable. The occasional times when I felt a little better were clouded with the knowledge that the relief was only temporary and soon darkness and suffocating feeling would be back. Probably sooner rather than later, too, reminded me that I would probably never have a normal life free of depression. Without the alcohol to numb the pain, I tried prescription drugs, counselors, self-help programs, and prayer. The drugs, counselors, and self-help programs all came and went. 
But I never gave up on prayer. I always felt that if there was any hope at all to be free of the depression, it would be a miracle from God through prayer. Then a couple years ago, I started attending Believer's Fellowship. This has been quite a few years ago now. Where I hit the jackpot when it came to finding friends. I would attend Sunday services and other Bible studies that were offered. Now, I'm not saying you have to go to church, attend classes, and etc. to be a good Christian, go to heaven, or experience miracles. But there are some great benefits in church attendance and fellowship with other Christians. I'm convinced that had I not started associating with other Christians, I would not have this testimony to give. At the Bible study, one of the men related how he had been healed through prayer. Not once, but three times. And this is where Ed Capsa was in my office and sharing about how God supernaturally healed him after falling off a, a scaffolding and onto concrete, shattered his arm, and the doctor said it would never work, right? You know, and, uh, it, and, it was, and he just said, no, that's not going to be. And he was healed. So that's what happened uh, in my office. Now, my first reaction was to be jealous. Now, you, and let me just say, you'd never know this most of the time by being around John. You wouldn't know that he fought depression, and you wouldn't know that he was just such a gentle guy that, that he'd actually be jealous, uh, you know. Uh, I mean, it was just it was nothing you could see. Why, why, he was fa why was he favored by God three times, all within minutes of asking to be healed, and I had been praying for almost 30 years with no results? God, why not me? You answer other people's prayers, why not mine? The same whining I'd been doing for almost 30 years. The next day at work, I was putting a, a, a lot of thought into why my prayers weren't being answered. And for the first time, I took a practical, non-emotional look at what I was doing. Looking at it from a practical point of view, told told me that there was only two of us involved in any prayer, me and God. Everyone knows God is perfect and doesn't do anything wrong, so any fault was all mine. My prayer immediately changed from God, why not me, to God, show me what I'm doing wrong. Instead of whining about what God did or didn't do, I took ownership of my own shortcomings. I have no idea what changes God made or didn't make in me or what I said or did. But the next, let me just stop there. I talked to John about this because he called me the next day and he said, do you believe that God touches people? I said, yeah. He said, no, I mean, do you believe God physically touches people? Now I'm starting to get nervous. What do you, you know, what's he up to? Because he was kind of like quizzing me like, like I was. I don't, I don't like tests. <laughs> so I thought, okay, why are you asking? You know, but I said, yes, I believe God fixed, physically touched them. He said, well, it's a good thing. Because <laughs> he said, God physically touched me. So I was laying in bed saying the same prayer. Was it the same prayer? I don't think it was just because John said, okay, I'm going to own my own stuff. That's an important thing for all of us. That's why the first thing I ministered this morning was, stop thinking you got something, that you're a whiz kid, because you're not. You're a born loser. That's the first thing to acknowledge, because you can't get saved if you don't know you're sick. You can't get healed. You, know, you, can't, you can't get righteous from a Savior if you're already righteous. You've got to acknowledge that I need a Savior. Okay? But I don't think that was the most important part. Something did change in his heart. Of what he believed. So let me back up. He said. So in the next morning I was laying in bed saying the same prayer. But it wasn't coming from the same heart. For 30 years. I've been praying this for years, and this time, the instant I asked to be healed, I knew my prayer had been answered. I physically felt something leave my body, and a soft touch in the center of my chest. I knew it had, been, it had to be the hand of God that touched me. It was three, four, he actually thought it was a cat that jumped on him at first. They like animals. 
It was 3.45 a.m. and two dogs, two cats, and a parakeet, and my wife were all asleep. This time the relief wasn't temporary, it was full on God. His love healed me, his truth has set me free. It's like having lived in a dark cave all my life and now coming out into the bright sunshine. He says, I'm, I'm less amazed at the vastness of God's universe than I am at the fact that he, the creator of this vast universe, as if he had nothing better to do, took the time to touch me and say, hey, John. Because that's what happened when he got touched. He said, I heard a voice say, hey, John. He threw all his uh, meds away that next morning, which terrified his wife. She called the kids and said, your dad's going to go crazy on me again. <laughs> and, uh, but he was free. Now, just like with John, Ed's just being Ed, sharing the glory of God. I want you to just think about this. But when John left my office, he was mad. He wasn't rejoicing. It was a great testimony Ed had, and it made him mad. You know, sometimes what we do is going to make people upset. Our biggest effort to help and love people are going to have them get mad. And they may get mad at you. Just stay calm. Let God do his work. Let people get mad sometimes. It's part of the process. And he got home and he was ticked off. And he just said, why, 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 why? 30 years of praying and nothing happened. But you know what I think is really honorable to John? That he didn't quit. You may say it's 30 years. I talked to him later. He says, you know, some, in some ways people say, could say, well, John, 30 years and all of a sudden it's done. Uh, don't you kind of regret it? He says, now that it's here, it doesn't bother me. It's here now. That's one way you really know when you're walking in the grace of God is that you don't look back and regret and say, oh, I could have been better. I should have done. You just say, man, it was a part of the process that got me here. It's part of my walk of discovery. It's happened to a lot of people that it's taken years for them to find. But thank God they didn't quit because they did find it. Hallelujah. And it's not just getting the healing. You know, he didn't get the healing in his body that he needed. I think I told you last week, but John fell eight stories, 35 feet, iron worker, straight down into concrete. And a little rope that they put on him back then snapped and spun him so he landed on his feet. Broke his legs and then crushed and all his, all, his back was compressed. He was an inch shorter instantly. And he fought nerve pain. They burned nerves. They did everything. Back surgeries, knee surgeries, hip surgeries. None of those things were instantly healed. <clears throat> I'm just saying, you can't compare on this thing. You got to just keep, get your focus on Jesus and just say, I want to live. But I, I'm glad, it was, even his son said, man, I don't know if you can understand, Pastor, what my dad is sharing. We lived with it all these years. He lived with it, and now he's free. And he stayed free. But here's the thing that I think is important for you and I to pick up is somewhere in that, by John just saying, okay, I've been complaining, now I'm just going to believe you. He also started, va there's just something about coming to that faith that, oh, I'm worthy to be healed. You know, there's people that take care of their dog way better than they take care of themselves. And what's wrong about that is the fact that, listen, what you and I get to believe is that God has actually, out of his own doing, made us his children. We, we are priests and we are a royal nation. We've entered the family of God. We're royal. We are now the owners of everything. How should that be treated? We're not arrogant. We're not prideful. But we are. We need to say, this is the temple of me, a child of God, and the temple of the Holy Spirit. This life that I live has been redeemed, and it cost the creator of the universe everything. That meant that it took a lot of power to get me. I was really in the doo-doo. I don't think some people realize how big a dude to the end. Well, I'm not that bad of a person. Are you kidding me? You were a born loser. had no chance of getting hope. You, uh, you got nothing. You were headed to, to eternity without nothing. 
man, when Jesus saved you, you ought to jump, you know. Somebody said once, oh, well, this guy, Barry McGuire, he's really happy because he was on drugs and God saved him. And I thought, I don't have to be on drugs to get happy about my salvation. I got delivered from fear from every I got I got not only delivered then I got placed into a family where I'm a joint heir I'm powerful I, I'm a child of God I need to start treating myself a little bit better I need to treat myself a little bit better than the dog or maybe a lot better and sometimes that's when we step into faith and that's when God power can actually flow in us Say this if you can. I'm a born lo- I was a born loser. I had no hope of winning. But then God saved me. And now I can't lose. I can't lose. The target could be over there and I could shoot that way and it'll hit it. Would you stand with me please? Thank you Jesus. You know, I really hope I didn't make anybody mad, but if I did, God bless you. Go home, get ticked off, yell and scream. Dig down deep and discover something inside of you. Discover that you, the years of, see, part of what John was looking for years to God to do something. Like it was God's choice not to do it. Why, God? Why not me? But the whole thing was God's always wanted him to have it. You know, God wants you to have peace and joy in the midst of every affliction that you got. And whether you get healed you know, right away from those afflictions, he's going to deliver you. But it's like you can walk in peace and joy in all of them. That's his will. That's his plan. He's not up there making decisions. He's already made his decision. I want to bless you. But see what happened in John. Someplace he finds he said, Oh, the problem isn't with him. Now you can take that and condemn yourself. Well, the problem is with me. I must be an idiot. Or you can say, I've got to discover what's really mine. I get to go on a treasure hunt. Help me, God. You know, and after 30 years, what blew my mind about John's testimony, after 30 years, he makes that simple little statement the next morning, and the next, that next morning, he's healed. Now, that might make me mad. I'm saying, you can say, whoa, whoa why did it take so long? And all I can say is, Jesus said, seek, and don't ever stop seeking. That's what you need to focus on. Father God, I thank you that today is a great day. It's just a great day. Because it's a day that we as your children get to have this incredible adventure of the discovery of what's inside of us. And I'm not talking just about our body and it's 2,000 processes per second per cell. That's pretty awesome. But it tells us about just how awesome we are. I'm just thanking you right now, Lord Jesus. For all of us discovering something new this this morning. In a deeper way, in a in a way of victory, of knowing who we are and who who Christ is and that He's inside us. And we're gonna boast and we're gonna boast in the Lord. That no matter what the world thinks of us, we're success happening. We are free from fear and we are absolutely redeemed. And now we get to share this light with everybody we meet. Holy Ghost, this has been an awesome time with you. Thank you very much. We love you and we love one another. In Jesus' name, amen.